A big welcome to you at home who have chosen to come and worship with us this morning at ALPC's live worship service. Thank you, Rick, for that beautiful prelude, gathering music that you had played. Let us now listen as we are drawn into worship through the prelude on the organ, prelude on a Welsh tune. Well, good morning. And you might be wondering why I'm wearing a blue construction shirt and work pants. What's a preacher doing that? He should have a robe on or a fancy suit. Well, we're in the midst of a worship series called Constructing Contentment in an Uncertain Time. And that's why I'm wearing work clothes as we together construct contentment based on the wisdom of Paul from his letter to the Philippians. Well, quite a lot was going on this week. Uh, in, in the church world, in the secular world, congratulations to both Avon and Avon Lake. Their football team's winning their games. They are ranked fourth and fifth in the area, and I'm hoping the two teams will be able to uh, combat against each other in, in the football tournament. Good, good luck to both of those teams. And we hope today that the Browns can beat the Steelers at home. Do you know when's the last time the Browns beat the Steelers at home? 2003. So you have to be at least 18 years old to have experienced that win. Well, we hope that they do. Although I know some of our members are Steelers fans and want the Steelers to continue their, their triumph. We'll see. We'll see what happens. That'll be later today at, at 1 o'clock. 
we are continuing to support the powerful ministry, Lorraine Cooperative Ministry. That's the food ministry that we and other churches are involved in. And one way that you can support that is through eating delicious food. This coming Saturday, we're having the Taste of Italy dinner. Now, usually this would be in a church, but it's drive through this Saturday. It'll be held at the Lorraine Lutheran Church. That's the one that was rebuilt after it was burnt a couple years ago. Uh, members of our mission committee have been making food from it, as well as members of all the different churches in, in the cooperative ministry. So that will be this Saturday from, what time is that? This Saturday from 5 to 6.30. Tickets are $10. You can purchase them here at the church. We, we encourage you to do that uh, so they'll know how many people are coming. What is next Sunday? Socktober! Socktober! And it's also Undie Over! I don't know if it's called Undie Over. Uh, we are, are gathering fresh, clean underwear for men that live in the Valor House in Lorraine. That's for homeless veterans. We're collecting uh, socks for, for all ages to help uh, homeless people in our, in our area, in our state, uh, of, all, of all ages. So you can bring them in this week, or you can bring them in next Sunday. And if you do that, from 11.30 to 1.30, we get to see each other and say hi, and how you doing, and check in. So bring them next Sunday, 11.30 to 1.30, and we'll have a great big outpouring of blessings for those in need. Uh, right now, I am online with you on the comment section in Facebook Live. We recorded this service earlier, and yet I invite you, if you're on Facebook Live right now, to sign in, type in, hi, hello, this is Charlie, so we can say hi and greet one another. And then if you have a prayer request, please put it in the comments, and I'll be sure to pray for you, and then take it to the Tuesday prayer group. That worked out great last week, and we took the prayers to the Tuesday prayer group, and they, they prayed for your prayers at that time. I think that is all the announcements that we have. So let us now uh, enter into worship, led by the first song, Build My Life.
Let us now open our hearts up to that living Spirit of God. Even though we are in our dining room, or in our living room, or our kitchen, or in our bedroom, or our study, no matter where we are, even though we are not in our beloved sanctuary, that Spirit of God comes to us, unites us, connecting us with God, with one another. Let us now set apart all distractions, good or bad, and give ourselves wholly to God in this glorious time of worship. Please join with me in the opening prayer. Dear Lord, we are grateful for the ability to worship you even when we are not in our sanctuary. Fill us up with your life-giving spirit. While we are missing the physical solidness of our Christian brothers and sisters, and while we miss the way our sanctuary focuses our bodies and minds on you when we are in it, we are thankful that your Holy Spirit is able to bring an awareness of Christ to us through these online worship services. Please bless all the mighty efforts that go into our virtual worship so that we can fall before you in truth and spirit. Whether we listen or sing along, use the music to delight the creative part of our minds. And now let us learn from you as you feed us with the bread of life. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Let us stand and sing this wonderful, winsome hymn, God of Great and God of Small. This God we praise is the God that we ask to cleanse our hearts that we can live deeper in his love. Let us each pray silently, asking God to make us more into his image and to remove those things from our habits and our words and our actions that are against his will and cause hurt. Let us pray silently, then follow me in prayer. Dear Lord Jesus Christ, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we thank you for the ways in which you've placed a solid foundation underneath our feet. We thank you for the grace that you have given us, that each of us knows how we are loved, 
how we are claimed by you, and how we not only have salvation, but we have ministry, a mission to do. That we are each set out by you to bring your love to this whole world, starting one person at a time. So we celebrate with you, O Christ, for all the good deeds you have done through us. And yet, God, we know that there were times when we resisted your call to love through indolence, through ignorance, through willfulness, and we ask for your forgiveness. We ask for your forgiveness. Pick us up again, O God. Cleanse us, brush us off, that we set out once more as your hopeful, confident people making this world a better place, one by one. Thank you, God, for your forgiveness. Amen. Friends, believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Amen. Let us pass this peace of Christ to one another. Do it on the comments. Say say it to your housemates. Text it to another. And let us now learn from Tara to the children's ministry. God, he is a master builder. He is building me. He builds with stuff that comes from heaven and tools we cannot see. He is a master builder, he is building me. He builds with stuff that comes from heaven and jewels we cannot see. Hi friends, good morning. I hope you're having a great day today. I'm so happy to be back with you again to talk about God, the master builder, and how we're building a friendship with him. We've learned a lot over the last four weeks. Let's review some of it. First, we learned about God. He made everything, and one of the most important things he thought to make was you. And on Christmas, God sent his son Jesus to be born. People saw Jesus. People wrote down the things he did and what he taught us. We learned about his love and forgiveness and the way God wants us to live. And then we learned about the Bible. The Bible is the special book full of all the stories about God and God's people. And it teaches us what Jesus told the people who were around him, what he wants us to know about God. Then we learned that when we listen to Jesus, he tells us that in our friendships, we should dig out the things that aren't good for us. If there's selfishness or lying, dig those things out and let Jesus help us have things like love and peace and patience in our friendships. Well, this week, we're going to learn something else Jesus tells us about building a friendship with God. And I have something in this box right here that will kind of help us learn that lesson about building a friendship with God. In the past, we've had a construction hat, I had a hammer, an excavator, different things that we might see on a construction site to help us learn a lesson about God. Let's see what's in there today. Are you ready? Oh, what? Co- Wait a minute. Socks and whoa, more socks. What could that teach us about building a friendship with God? Well, one of the reasons that socks are in here is because this month is Socktober. And all month long at our church, we're collecting socks for people in need. You know, you and I might have socks to keep our feet warm when it gets cold, but not everyone does. And some people need help getting socks so that they can stay warm when winter comes. So we're collecting socks, and next Sunday, October 25th, I'll be at the church with some other church members collecting socks, new socks, from 11.30 to 1.30. But what do socks have to do with building a friendship with God? Actually, I'll tell you. Jesus tells us many times in the New Testament that our friendship with God is better by how we treat the people here on earth. 
In a verse that the grown-ups are going to hear today from Pastor Charlie, Jesus tells us that we should look out for the good of others. That's in the book of Philippians. And in Matthew chapter 25, Jesus tells us that how we treat other people is kind of a sign of how we treat God. When we take care of people who are hungry, who need clothes, who are lonely, God is watching and saying, that is how you're treating me. So by donating socks, that's one way we can show God that we care about our friendship with him. But there's lots of other ways we can do that too. Maybe by sending a letter or a picture to someone who's lonely, you can show them that you care about them. Maybe there's cans of food that you can donate to people who are hungry. Maybe you can share a kind word with a friend who is sad. When you look out for the good of others, when you find ways to share God's love with others, you're also telling God that your friendship with him is important to you. This week, I challenge you to really think of something special you can do for someone in need. I'm going to pray that you have someone that you can reach out to and help. And by doing so, you're showing God that you care about your friendship with him. Let's say a prayer and ask for God's help with that. Dear God, this week we're going to work really hard to find a way to help others around us and show them that you care about them. And by doing so, we show you that we care about you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Bye, friends. I really hope I see you next Sunday from 1130 to 130. I hope you'll come and drop off a new pair of socks. But no matter what, always remember, God made you, God loves you, and God is always with you. See you next week. Bye-bye. Thank you, Tara. At this time, we open our hearts to others as we lift up to God their cares, and their needs. As Paul says, as we put their interests first before our own. From Cheryl Dean, uh, a prayer to lift up her mother, whose health is failing. And from her to lift up her, her cousin David, who's struggling with health issues. And a joy that today on Sunday, she and Mike are celebrating their 40th wedding anniversary. That's fantastic, Cheryl and Mike. Congratulations to you. Let us pray. Dear God, we do lift up Cheryl's mother, such a sweet, loving Christian woman who has spent her whole life serving you and living in your way and in your love. Be with her as her health is failing, giving her your comfort and giving her your strength. And we lift up Cheryl's cousin, David, who is struggling inside with health issues. Please heal him. Please, please give him wholeness. Please give him health. And we celebrate with joy the 40 years of, of marriage that Mike and Cheryl have had. Uh, continue to bless their relationship together. Continue to give them laughs. Continue to give them love. Continue to give them joy. In your name we pray. Amen. We are part of the Presbytery, the Presbytery of the Western Reserve. And the General Presbyter, uh, Reverend Sharon Kaur, had some prayer requests for all the churches. Uh, let us remember Reverend Natalie McWilliams, uh, who had served the Lord faithfully and died in Breckenridge Ridge uh, Village. Uh, let us pray. Dear God, we give thanksgiving for the life of Reverend McWilliams. And we thank you for all in her that is good and gracious in the way that she inspired a deeper love of your dear name. We thank you that for her, weakness is over and death is past, and that she has been received into your kingdom and light. Amen. And prayers for Reverend Robin Craig, who is in the hospital for surgery. Let us pray. Dear Lord God, we lift up Reverend Robin Craig and ask for your strength to be with her, to bring her healing through the surgery before her. In your name we pray. Amen. Uh, let us continue in our prayers. 
Dear God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, we know that so many of us have difficult times that we're going through for all sorts of different reasons. Due to the COVID virus, some of us have had work cut or without work and are struggling financially. Due to the COVID crisis, some of us have gotten sick and are in quarantine or have known people who did and are in quarantine and how difficult it is to be separate from others in these hard ways. And dear Lord God, we just ask for all those who are sick from any reason, any ailment, any chronic or new illness, that you guide them to the medical care that they need, that your spirit is entwined with their spirit, using whatever medicine or treatments they are receiving to bring health into your, their bodies. We do ask, O oh God, and lift all those up who are seeking your strength, straining to find and hold on to the healing that you give us. We thank you, God, for your life-giving spirit and love. We lift up, O oh Lord, our nation, as we are all aware that these are difficult, strained times, times that strain the, the bonds of democracy and civility and kindness from stranger to stranger. Ask that you be at work through people, that they treat one another well, with dignity, not judging one another's motives, but only actions, and that they go out of their way to extend kindness and mercy. Dear God, we pray all of these things in your name, as we say, as Christ taught us, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This week, as members, we received a beautiful letter from our stewardship committee, uh, Jackie Butry and Barbara Schweitzer, uh, called Having Faith in a Time of Uncertainty, in which they reminded them, us of all the ways in which our church has been a, a rock and a comfort for us through this uh, COVID time, and asking us to consider prayerfully our financial support for the year ahead. Thank you, Barbara. Uh, thank you, Jackie. And we give gratitude to God for the faithfulness he inspires in us to continue to give of our financial resources to support the work of this mighty church. Let us pray. Dear Lord God, we ask you to take these gifts and to use them so that your love and grace is experienced and known. Amen. Let us continue to worship through song. Oh uh -huh. 
We want to see Jesus to reach out and touch Him and say. Today's scripture reading is Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 8a. If then there is any encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, any sharing in the Spirit, any compassion and sympathy, make my joy complete. Be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Jesus, Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not re regard equality with God 
as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Thank you, Terry. You know what? Terry was the reader. On the very first Sunday after the governor shut down the state, that we had a streamed worship service. And she and I met the day before on Saturday in the narthex, trying to figure out how we would do this. So Terry, a fondness in my heart, as I recall, that was the very first service. And here you are reading again. Thanks for your, your service uh, to, to the church, to your assistance in, in worship. Paul had said, in a time of great discontent and uncertainty, he says, I have learned to be content with whatever I have. When he had plenty, when he had little, when he was treated well, when he was treated harshly, when things were good or things were bad, he said, I have learned the secret. And that secret is to be in Christ Jesus. Over this series, we pulled out of the book of Philippians the secrets that Paul gives to us so that we can construct contentment, one practice at a time. We started this series with an empty toolbox to emphasize that we would be filling the tool up, toolbox up with different tools. And we've gone through a blueprint showing us the direction, the person that we have become, our, our tool belt and gloves, showing the contentment that comes through fruitful labor. We had a T-square exemplifying the firm foundation that we build with confidence in heaven. Last week, we took up a shovel as we learned the contentment that comes with emptying ourselves and being filled with the Spirit of Christ, filled with the mind of Christ. And today, today we will take up the two-person cross-cut saw. Let us pray. Dear Lord God, we thank you for the reading that Terry has done. We thank you for the words of Scripture that Paul wrote while he was in prison so that others would know the joy and the contentment that he finds and found in you. Help us to learn from you this morning. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Paul says, make my joy complete. Be of the same mind. Have the same love. Being in full accord and one mind. If you are in the woods and you need to cut down some trees, or maybe you need to cut, down, cut some logs up for firewood for, to build a fire, or if you have a cabin that's chilly and you want it to be heated up, you're by yourself. you got an axe. you got a chainsaw. You can go as fast as you want with that chainsaw. Or you can go as slow as you want. You don't have to cooperate with anybody. But if you're going to work with another person, well, that's a whole different story. We know that when we work together, as Paul says, one heart, one mind, one accord, the things can be beautiful. In the frontier days, this was one of the main tools that people used for cutting down big trees, huge trees, an axe wouldn't do. You would need a two-person cross-cut saw. If in your community you needed to cut down logs and mill them for building a church, if you didn't have a power mill, you would need, and your friends, one of these two-person cross-cut saws. A little one-person saw wouldn't do. A hatch or an axe wouldn't do the trick. And if you were cutting down a huge tree and you tried to do it by yourself, oh, it could be so dangerous. It could twist and bind, fall on your cabin, fall on you. And so you would need to work with another person. Now, once you were going to put your hand on a cross-cut saw with another, well, you can't be selfish now. Now you have to cooperate. My uncle, who, among other things, is an expert woodsman, he tells me of when his grandfather 
sat him down and told him how to use a two-man cross-cut saw. His grandfather said to him, you can't be selfish. You can't be selfish. You can't just grab the handle and start pulling and pulling as fast or slow as you want to. Because if you both are doing that, you're not going to cut down the tree. You're not going to cut the logs in nice sections. The, the, the blade is going to bind. It's not going to go straight. Somebody's going to get hurt. The blade might jump out. No. When you are cutting down a tree with a two-person saw, you have to listen and watch them. You have to pay attention to what they are doing. As both of you, that wouldn't work. Let's see if I can do this. As both of you are pulling that saw together, have to go at the same pace. You have to go at the same rhythm. You have to go with the same speed and the same direction, the weight on the handles, and then working together in unity. You can cut wood safely cut down trees. The two-person saw is our image today of how when we want to do things well together, we have to show a humility, listening and paying attention to the other. Paul said, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility, in humility, regard others as better than yourselves. I love this next line. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. That is so important. You know, when people are just looking out to their self-interest, if we have to get what we want, well, then we make live misery for others. If you watch a group of toddlers, if there's one of those toddlers who insists on his own way, he's got to have the toy, he's got to have the food, he's got to ha have the control of the game, you know what happens? Someone will get bonked in the head. Somebody will cry. Somebody will run away and want dad or mom. It doesn't work out well. Not only toddlers, is it, that insist on their own way and make a mess of good things. And nobody's content when that happens, are they? Any group that we're in, a family gathering, a work gathering, it's two, three, five, six, seven people. We know if there's one person in that group who insists on their way, that creates misery for everyone. And if there are two, if there are two people in a group of six, seven, five, ten that insist on their own way, we know what will happen next, right? Loggerheads will happen. Are we content? Oh, we're anxious. We're nervous. We're not content. But as Paul says, when we put others' interests first. Oh, we know how wonderful that is, don't we? You know, we're in a, 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 at work or in a, or in a sports league or community league at church. When we're together in a group and nobody's insisting on their own way. Oh, how joyful it is to work in that group together. The contentment that the whole community experiences is wonderful. Paul says, be of the same mind, the mind of Christ. Be of one accord, of one heart. And how does that happen? It happens when we put others' interests first ahead of our own. It's a beautiful thing. It's a wonderful thing. I want you to think of your own family. Do you put the other's interests ahead of your own? Or do you insist when there's a disagreement that you are right and that your way must be followed? If you do, you are creating discontentment in the family. And if you do that, 
in all your experiences that you have to be listened to and you have to be followed, you are going to be very discontent because the world's not going to agree with you. It's just not unless you live alone. But if you're with at least one other person, you're not going to be agreed with on everything. And that creates an inner tension if we have to have our way, if things have to go forward the way that we saw them. We create so much turmoil within ourselves as what we want doesn't meet up with what happens. But Paul says a secret to contentment is to put aside my own interests and look to the interests of others. Oh, this is not new. Isn't that the heart of what Jesus teaches? Isn't that the heart of what he says when he looks out at the people, the crowd, disciples, and he says, do for the other person like you would have them do for you. Right? Think of the interests of others and how you can help them Fulfill their dreams. How can you help them have their needs met? Isn't that the heart of the matter when Jesus says, love your neighbor as you love yourself? It is the heart of the Christian life to look not first to our own interests, but to look to the interests of others. And I know as individuals, we do that well. I know that we all have enjoyed that contentment as we've given up on the idea that everyone has to do what we say. As we've given up on the idea that I have to be right and instead listen to Jesus and listen to how we can help others. It's a beautiful thing in any meeting when people feel free to put forward ideas and notions, but without holding on to the outcome. It's a beautiful thing when people, and it is the heart of the Presbyterian way of government, the Presbyterian polity, as it's called. It is based on this, this text of Paul's, that we go into discussions, we have to make decisions, We have to find the best path. We put forth ideas, and then we discuss them with our intelligence, our experience, with our other hopes. But we don't hold on to the outcome or our idea. We don't position to make sure that our idea has ascendancy and we are seen as smart or wise or wonderful. No. We put our self-interest down, look to the interests of others, And just decide together, what is the best path for us at this moment? We as individuals do a very good job of this, of looking to the interests of others. I know it is the heart of our mission work. It is the heart of this particular church. As we love putting others first and doing for them. And yet, in our society, we have noticed that there is not a justice between the way that, as a group, white people treat black people. There is not a looking to the other's interests first, but there is a, let's take care of ourself first. This is nothing new. There was a wise theologian, oh, gee, a hundred years ago. His name was Reinhold Niebuhr. He wrote a book in the 1930s called Moral Man in an Immoral Society. And he noticed that individuals, like all of us in this church, are able to work against their own self-interest and to do what is best for others. But he noticed that groups do not seem to be able to do that. Kind of a a bit of a discouraging and pessimistic his work. 
But he's just looking over history at that time. He noticed that groups will always tend to fight for themselves, to try to pull in all they can for their group. They'll try to take from others, will try to destroy others, all for themselves, and see it as the good, even though their own personal ethics would have them do otherwise. As we look at this point in our national and world history, we've come to the realization there is social injustice woven into the fabric of our life. You may call it white privilege. You can call it what you want. But we know that woven in the fabric of our nation is an injustice against people of color, especially black. And we're disturbed by it now. Our eyes have been opened. And most of us, almost all of us are saying, this can't go on. We have to find a way to, to better love one another as Christ calls us to. But there is a cost to do what Paul says, to look to the interests of others and not ours. And are we willing, as a group, as white people, to pay those costs? Here is an example where we so far as whites have not been willing to pay the cost for blacks to be raised up in the justice world. That's in terms of education. All of us agree there is an injustice in the educational system around the country. Within the state of Ohio, this has been proven in the court of law that there is, in reality, unequal education for those who are black and those who are white. The Ohio State Supreme Court determined about 10, 15 years ago that the system of financial support for blacks is unequal. The, the state system in Ohio, and that it must be changed. That ruling came down. What has happened? Did the people in Ohio tell their legislators, make the changes so we have equality in education for all children, black and white. We want that to happen. No. Did white legislators come forward and say, oh, let's change the financial situation so that poor black children get more of the state's money to see that their education is as good as white children's? No. Why not? Self-interest. I look forward to the day when that will change. When there will be white legislators who will decide, what can we do to see that the funding is changed so that black children have equal education as white children, regardless of the richness or poorness of the property owners, as which we know that funding of school is based on the property taxes of the school district. Let that trouble you. Let that bother you. For in spite of our well wishes that there be equality in the school system, so far, we white people have not been willing to make sacrifices of what we receive so that black children will have an equal education. Paul calls us to find contentment through treating others better than ourselves. Paul says, I have found the secret of contentment. And one of the secrets, and we take this saw, is not fighting to have control, not fighting to make it go the way I want to, but working in unity with others, paying attention to what they want and what they need. Be willing to give some of what I have so that others have more, so that we have one mind, one heart. Amen.
let us receive the benediction and blessing of our Lord. And before we go out, we all heard this week how COVID-19 has been going up in the state, how states have been going from yellow to orange and orange to red, how something like 65% of the Ohio residents now live in Red County. So as we go out, let us be careful. Let us practice safe social distancing. Let's wear those masks, as our governor says. Let's show our love, the respect to the others. Let's do what we can. Keep safe and keep others safe. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.